Hello, welcome to the Mag Life Podcast. I've got an awesome guest today that's going to get you good and motivated. Those of you who listen to this show for a while, you know that we usually talk about something that's going to hopefully you know, help you protect yourself, your family, those that you love, uh, but also find things to talk about that can help us become better humans. And uh, I think Chad knows a little something about that, and uh, he's going to be a awesome guest for this. Chad, welcome to the Mag Life Podcast. How are you doing today? Oh, Daniel, I'm doing awesome, brother. I'm I'm happy to be here with you. I'm honored to be here with you. Everybody that's listening, thank you for tuning in. I hope I can share something that might help you uh, some at some point, some place in your life. So uh, I'm fired up about this, brother. See, I was just telling uh, our videographer here, I was like, man, I should have drank some espresso. I should have like hit some caffeine, some pre-workout or something before. I was like, because Chad is going to come in here like crazy high energy. Because you ultra marathon runners, man, like there's a little bit of, weird insanity and and the energy that that most humans don't have yeah uh well you know uh, and and it doesn't help i just finished a 20 ounce coffee here and and i am a coffee snob this is coffee house coffee straight out of an espresso machine four shots in this thing um (laughs) dude i stay yeah i stay pretty amped up until uh until it's time to hit the uh hit the sack at night and uh i'm blessed uh with to be passionate about the things that God has given me to share, man. I, I and I think it's 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 passion is what it is for me. You know, nobody's ever achieved anything in life without having a little passion behind it. That's and true. Uh, you know what I mean. And, and I'm so passionate about uh, sharing these these stories. It's just amazing that somebody will listen, man. You know, yep. it's like I'm this freaking country dude from North Georgia that uh, somehow made it through SEAL training. I don't even know how that happened. Spent 12 years in the SEAL teams. I get out, and now all these people want to hear the lessons that I've learned. I'm so honored, man. It's freaking awesome. Look, well, you're, you're a little bit different than, than most of my SEAL buddies. Um, you don't have as, as, as like perfect hair as, as a lot of them. <laughs> I've let myself go. I've let myself go, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> I, 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 I was medically retired from the Navy uh, in January of 2019, and I literally have not shaved or cut my hair since January of 2019. So, uh, yeah, it's just my style, man. But I agree. Most team guys, they got to have the best haircut, the coolest sunglasses. The, you got to be a good-looking guy to begin with to be a SEAL. It's like part pre- of the rules. Like, you don't get a bunch into of- butts. Yeah, man, we're a bunch of prima donnas, dude. All buds <laughs> is is a it's a big fraternity. I, I tell people this; they do, they don't even understand it. If you go to buds and there is one instructor at buds that just doesn't like the way you look, if it, maybe your eyes are a little too close together or your nose is crooked or you know there's something about you that they don't like, they're gonna they're gonna get you out of there. They have they, to uphold the standards. <laughs> <laughs> the, honor the the naval traditions. Everything I else. heard that, brother. Yeah, yeah, man. So let me let me start off right there. You know, um, so why why the seals? Why why the navy? You know, you can go back to is there a moment you know in childhood or teenage years or something or uh, what what led you there? Uh, definitely not childhood. Uh, what I growing up, man, I had I I I hunted. I hunted. That's all I did. And um, I had never met a active duty service member, never seen anyone in uniform, didn't have any family members that had served, uh, was never thought about joining the military. And um, I barely graduated high school. I had to go around on the last day of high school and beg my teachers to change my grades in the computer so that I could graduate. And it's not because I wasn't... uh, smart per se it was just because I didn't like school I thought it was silly um, I had a strong work ethic I had a lot of grit I was used to being outside in the in the elements and the you know this and that and so I got out of high school and I went to work in the construction industry and I realized I was surrounded by these people that it, it was like they were just content with what life was giving them. Their, their four or five hundred dollar a week yeah. paycheck, and you know that that's cool. If you're content with that, that's awesome. That's a really simple, awesome life, right? 
for some reason, there was something in me, though, that was like, man, I, I want a little bit more. What what can I do? I, I don't like college. Um, I, I'm, you know, that's not an option. I, I don't have any uh, hard skills. I, I don't, I'm not a welder or, or any, you know, technical skills. So I was sitting uh, one day in front of my computer, and back then they were recruiting for the Navy SEALs. And this ad banner pops up, and it says, uh, SEAL training, the hardest training in the world. And I was like, holy crap, what is that? I didn't even know what a SEAL was. I didn't know how to swim. I didn't even <laughs> know how to swim. But I saw that it said the hardest training in the world. And I said, man, I want to check that out. So I started looking at it, and I, I, I went to a, I actually went to a Marine recruiter first. Because I didn't know the difference between the Navy and the Marine Corps. This is how dumb I was, man. This is how ignorant I was. And I went to the Marine Marine recruiter, and I had a meeting with this guy, and he's like, oh, no, we don't do the – the SEALs aren't part of us, but, you know, we have all this other cool stuff. And I, and I asked the Marine recruiter, I said, well, what do you do? And he said, I'm a logistics guy. And, and I thought, what is that? He said, well, I drive a truck. And um, I thought, well – I don't want to. I don't want to go and go over here in the Marine Corps because I might end up being a truck driver. That's how. <laughs> that's how stupid I was. Like, like, like. So, so then I went over to the Navy recruiter and he said, "Oh yeah, man, we can get you this SEAL contract, but you got to pass this physical standards test." So I said, "All right, that sounds good." I showed up to take that physical standards test. That's when I realized I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't swim. I couldn't run. I could do about three pull-ups. I failed it miserably. Just kept failing it. And, and until I could learn how to swim, I kept showing up. I kept coming back, taking this thing. Finally freaking passed it. My wife, girlfriend at the time, taught me how to swim. I ran. I tried to run. But I got the worst shin splints in my life. I was about 220 pounds at this time. And uh, I would wake up in the mornings after going to take that test. It was a mile and a half run. I'd wake up the next morning and try to stand up out of bed, and I'd just fall over on the ground. My legs hurt so bad. But I just kept showing up. I just, I, I decided this was what I wanted to do. And uh, I passed that thing. I joined the Navy. Went, I got all the way through boot camp. On the last day of boot camp, I was disqualified from ever becoming a SEAL. And I had to get out of the Navy. I read something about that, but it's not my story to tell. But, uh, <laughs> it's it's a bit extreme. So yeah, man. Carry on. Yeah, I, I get. A, I, yeah, I wanted to pause there for a minute because I I know I'm talking a lot here, but I guess that's the point of a podcast. That's my favorite. Talk. When I don't have to talk, and somebody goes <laughs> on here and talks, like that's the best. <laughs> I heard that, brother. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I I get to the last day of boot camp. I had cashed in. I had I I had like cashed all my chips in on this Navy SEAL thing, right? Uh, I didn't have anything back home. When I left home, I gave my truck to my brother. I had no money. I had no house, nowhere to live, nothing. I just left to go do this thing. And um, and then last day of boot camp, they pulled me out. They send me up to medical, and the dive medical officer says, Chad, you have a 7-centimeter pericardial cyst on your heart. He says, now, it's asymptomatic. You've lived with it your whole life. Uh, it's not going to ever cause you any issues, but we're afraid when you dive underwater as a combat diver, if you so happen to make it through SEAL training, uh, that the pressure change is going to burst this cyst on your heart and kill you. And I said, well, daggone, man. Uh, well, well, let's have surgery to take this thing off. And the Navy doctor's like, no, we're not doing a surgery to remove an asymptomatic cyst. You're just, you, you need to pick a job, uh, a different job in the Navy. That doesn't require you to dive or jump. Oh man! And I was like, I was like, no, man. I, I, I can't. This is where I set my goals was to become a, a naval special warfare SEAL operator. And uh, he said, well, sorry about that. You're just going to have to leave this organization then. So I got out of the Navy with an administrative discharge, and I show back up to my hometown here in North Georgia. Everybody laughed at me when I left. Right, because they said, "Here's this, dumb, here's this dumb old redneck. He's going to do this seal thing. Of course, he's not going to make it." Well, 
they got some satisfaction when I showed back up in my same hometown about two or three months later. And uh, I'm trying to tell them. We're talking about the same people who were content with just like some BS job that was getting them by enough money to get some beer on the weekends. That's it. That's it, brother. That, you know, so that those are the guys that are laughing at me, man. I I had the same friends. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, no, man, they're, they're all of course like, oh yeah, of course you didn't make it, Chad. You freaking quitter. And I'm like, oh, I actually have this cyst on my heart. And of course, nobody's going to hear that. I mean, nobody freaking believes that. No, nobody's ever even heard of a pericardial cyst. Yeah, is that going to work? Would you be on this podcast like I was going to be a SEAL, but, you know, like I was going to join the Marines, but I've heard it my whole life, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, man. And nobody quits buds. Nobody, everybody gets injured, right? Uh, th- like, right. that's that's the thing in, in SEAL training is like, no, there are no quitters. Everybody just gets hurt. Yeah, that's everybody's story. Yeah, right. Um, anyways, I, I get back home and I'm still just hell bent on getting to, to become a seal. Like I, I, this is, I have nothing else on the table, dude. Like I have no what other, year was this? this was uh 2000, this would have been 2007 by this time. Okay. And, um, uh, so I, I start going, I start making appointments with heart surgeons here in Atlanta. And I go in and I see these cardiologists and these heart surgeons and I tell them, hey, I want to be a SEAL, but I got this cyst. Here, here's my f- f- medical file from the Navy. Here's the x-rays showing the cyst, this and that. And they're like, well, no, like you're an 18-year-old kid. We're not, we're not cutting your chest open to remove this thing. They were telling me the same thing the Navy doctor told me, right? And uh, finally, I found a surgeon after about three or four appointments that he was the leading heart surgeon here in Atlanta and he was willing to, to cut me open and take this thing on off of my heart. He had never done the surgery before. This was the first time this condition was, had ever been seen in a Naval special warfare candidate. And also it was, it's rare as a, as a whole in, in all of society, this surgeon had performed hundreds or thousands of surgeries and had never performed this specific surgery. So it was a very unique opportunity for him and um, another thing for me is when I cut ties with the Navy and, and, and left and became a civilian again, the Navy didn't tell me when I left. They didn't say, if you have this cyst removed, we'll, we'll let you back in. No, they didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just said, we'll see you later, uh, probably never again. So I'm going in here, driving to the hospital at 530 in the morning to, to have some surgeon cut my chest open. For for what? Uh, I, just just for maybe a chance to get back into the Navy, all right? And then even more so to get to at least get on the start line of, of SEAL training and then get through SEAL training. So, like, it's insane, dude. It's no, it, absolutely it's definitely insane. I don't, I don't know if it was like, man, was this guy just, like, dumb or just so blinded by your goal, you know? And I... If it's the the latter, like that, it's scary, but freaking admirable at the same time. Yeah, you know? I I was front sight focused, man, and, and I'm the same way in life today. I'm front sight focused. Literally, when when I get honed in on on whether it's a nowadays a, a ultra marathon, a, a business goal, um, a, my relationship with Jesus, whatever it may be, when I get honed in on something, dude, you better look out. And let me tell you right now, I'm not advising this mentality necessarily because a lot of times other things in your life will suffer when you get too front sight focused on one single thing. So you'll likely achieve success, all right? You'll likely achieve success, but maybe your wife's not going to be very happy or your husband's not going to be very yeah. happy with you or maybe your relationship with your children might suffer or or a family member or a friendship. Um, so, you know, it's just the way... God made me. Uh, he he just I guess he pre-programmed me this way, and um, so anyways I have this cyst removed from my heart. The surgery is successful. I recover very quickly because I'm young and I'm strong and my body's fit. And uh, I, I'm gonna say it was about a I don't know maybe a four to five month long recovery after this thing, and um, I submit my paperwork back into the Navy. They say, okay, Chad, we're, well, we're going to let you at least back in the Navy. 
but uh, we can't. We don't know that we're going to let you go to SEAL training. So they bring me back in as a NAVET, so I don't have to go back through boot camp again because I made it to the last day. They stick me in this open bay holding unit, and I sit there for about five months while they review my case, while they review the paperwork from my surgery, and make a decision on whether to allow me to even get on the start line for SEAL training. And uh, at the end of that five months, they made a decision. They blessed me off, and I went to what's called pre-buds. It's in Great Lakes, Illinois. Look, dude, by this time, when I finally got to line up on the start line, I had so much invested in this in this process that I could not deviate. I could literally the only thing at this point because I had stuck with it for so long. And I had so much investment. I, they would have had to kill me. I don't say that lightly uh, to, to make me go away. I got honor man of my pre-buds class, crushed that, went out to San Diego, started SEAL training, and I freaking just went right through SEAL training. Never failed at a single evolution, was never rolled, Was uh, never had any issues. We started out with 300 dudes. We graduated with 18 dudes at the end of six months. And, um, hey, man, the, the, the thing about this is, though, that I, that I want the listeners to understand, if I'm going to be totally honest with you, when I reflect back on my life and where I was at uh, mentally, if I, would have got, if I would have gotten the chance to go to SEAL training the first time, I don't think I would have made it. Yeah. I think that I, I knew and God knew that I had to be passed through this furnace of adversity yeah. uh, in order to come out the other end and then embark on this journey to become this thing that God created me to be for that for that time span of my life, which was a seal. He knew it. I didn't know it. It sucked. It sucked walking through that process, but that process led me to a point that I I could no longer deviate from it. It just I'm a it, big what, fan it was going to happen. I love stories, like the like gold stories, people's stories. And I, I think story is one of the most powerful things out there. You know, they it's they say that other things the oldest profession. And I think storytelling around the fire is the the oldest profession out there. Maybe he gets extra cut of meat or something. You know, sitting around there yeah, with man. caveman telling a story. But that right there, it enhances your story. So I was like, what kind of crazy eighteen year old kid is going to take a incredibly risky heart surgery to go do something that's even more risky? You know, it's like, it's uh, it, it, it's pretty wild. That's a, that's a heck of a beginning to your story right there. Yeah, brother, it was it was a wild ride, man. Uh, and so yeah, made it made it through SEAL training, no no issues. Then we then we go through SQT SEAL qualification training, uh, and then I show up to my SEAL team. Uh, I spent my entire career at SEAL Team Eight, and um, did multiple deployments there. And then uh, I was a SEAL instructor for the last few years of my of my uh, career uh, where I earned master training specialist certificate. And uh, I loved, I lo- that's where I really lo- learned that I loved t- to teach. What and, did you teach then? Uh, I taught, started out teaching land warfare and then moved into teaching VBSS and maritime operations. So, um, you know, uh, kind of, and we did some, I taught some breaching and some CQC and, and we were kind of all over the place within the, the structure of the training command in the SEAL teams, you can bounce around and work as hard as you want to work. If you want to go on a trip with the close quarters combat cell, you can go on a trip and instruct there. Um, so I got to really uh, teach a lot and I got to learn a lot. I, what I realized, I, I realized that I love teaching and I also realized that I learned more in like two years as an instructor than I learned in 10 years as an operator. Yep. It was, it I was always, unbelievable. Say, that's a true statement. You never really truly understand something or know it until you have to teach it. Because you, especially, I, I'm not going to tell my story because this is you're you're the guest. But there was a time in my life when I got around doing some VBSS and some hostage rescue stuff, and I was put to do security or trailer and process rooms. We end up clearing rooms and stuff with them. Um, a lot of qualifications to be able to go on the crisis site and on the the vessel and everything else, and. Um, I would always just stand around these guys taking notes. And then years later, I'm teaching people, and there's a bunch of people standing around me taking notes. 
and I'm and I realize like, man, I they listen, they trust me, they think I'm right. Like I don't even know I'm right sometimes. I need to make sure that I'm right about everything I say because all these folks trust me and they're believing in, in what I tell them. So I can't get it wrong because they're going to go back and teach their guys too. And uh, it's a big responsibility when you're teaching. A hundred percent, brother. It is. And you got to answer questions that you may have never thought of before. And yep. it's, it's a valuable thing. And, and I think that teaching is uh, it's part of the process to becoming the master of anything. Uh, you have to start out as the student. Then you have to become the operator, the person that's on the ground in the fight, you know, doing the work. Then you have to become the teacher. And only after you have spent that time teaching will you really achieve mastery at whatever it is, tactics or, or business or uh, running or whatever it is. Um, yep. So, um, you know, man. The martial and, arts community does awesome at that. Oh, with yeah. Their pipelines. And they, they'll... I I'm always say I'm jealous because I teach guns, you know, defense and stuff. And I'm like, man, I got to get this system where they get to a certain belt and then they go and teach everybody else, but I make the money and they still pay me to be able to teach like they, the black belts do at the place they're training it. Like they, they figured this stuff out a long time ago in the martial arts world. Like I, I'm jealous. Well, we're doing that right now with our business here at three or seven project, man. I mean, we, we have, uh, our, our entry level, I guess, training is called the basic course or I take a team of eight people out into the wilderness uh, for three days and uh, teach them uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, everything from hard skills to uh, mindset to spiritual growth and just the, the, the we, we study body, soul, and spirit, right? So the whole aspect of a human being, we're composed of those three things. And then they move from there, they graduate to an experience we have, have called the Proving Grounds, which is a which is we push a little harder there. Then we have the finishing school, and then we have instructor training. Um, so I love the pipeline; it, it works. That's a cool man. pipeline. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it just it simply works, and you know, it's been a ride, brother. Um, Let I, me I'll, ask you something about that specifically before we move away from the. I mean, we'll come back and talk to the the, the three seven project when you take these people out and. You're taking them out of their comfort zone. Obviously, they're they're probably out of their comfort zone the whole three days out there. The things they're learning, the lack of AC, maybe no cell signal, nothing else. Um, why do you do that? Why 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 the the outside the the wilderness for your your medium to deliver your message and, and training? Oh man, for so many reasons, dude. I I mean, one because it never gets boring. Um, because so every we we've done uh, eleven basic course teams over the last year, and um, every single mission is totally different because you never know what the wilderness is going to throw at you. It might throw heat at you. It might throw cold at you. It might throw rain. It might throw snow. It might throw all those things at at, at some point over the course of that three days. So it never gets boring. Uh, it's and, and it's real. So I, I got I got out of the Navy and I'm looking around me at these other other companies that facilitate training and and they they seemed to be canned to me like more of like a corporate uh, you know uh, available to the masses right yeah. and, and and they have and when you do that you have to tailor your training to the lowest common denominator or you're going to have people getting hurt. All right? Yep. So I wanted to provide an environment, a, an experience in a real environment that's not canned. First of all, uh, to you have to apply for this. I only take eight people per team, and I don't even tell you how to apply. That's the first step. You have to figure it out. It's not that hard. And then I literally go through... The, you have to send me the five W's. I go through every single application. I have, I've got hundreds of these, hundreds of applications, and I hand pick each person for each team. And so I know I've got the cream of the crop, all right, and I can take them out and put them through a real legit experience out here in the wilderness that's going to throw crap at you that you don't see coming. And another thing about it, is I think people are hungry right now for uh, for some spiritual growth, man. I'm a Christian, right? I serve Jesus Christ, the God, the Father, the Creator of all of this. 
Um, and if I want to, sh- if I want some, if I want to give someone the opportunity to grow spiritually alongside that physical growth aspect, if I can get them out into creation, right, untouched, pure creation, that spiritual growth comes right alongside that physical and mental growth. Because you're amongst an environment where you cannot help but look around you. And if you have any common sense at all, you cannot help but have the thought, somebody built this. So yeah. th- This is not a freaking accident, man. And like, you're taking these people likely to one of the most beautiful places on the planet people don't know about. And that's the Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, all that, or uh, Virginia, parts of the Appalachian Trail. That's it, brother. The Blue Ridge Mountains, just absolutely amazing spot on the planet. It's been a lot of time up there. It is, man. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that you get out up there. It is. It's a a hidden gem, and um, it's just a great environment, brother. That's why we've chosen to do that, and it's a part of me, too. I mean – you know, I, I love, we, we, in SEAL training, you do, you know, you go up to Kodiak, Alaska and spend two months surviving in that cold weather environment and learning how to forge and set snares and build shelter. And, you know, so from a skills perspective, it's right up my alley and it's just the best environment to push yourself and to uh, learn new things about yourself, all aspects of yourself, in my opinion. You can't do it a in theory. a freaking hotel room, conference, uh, hotel conference no. room. No way. And no, no matter how you do your breakout groups or whatever they call them, you know, everything else, not going to work. No. Nope. Uh, you know, it, I believe for you know a long time, and, and a friend of mine who's not too far from you, actually about your size and, and, and even kind of resemble each other a little bit, uh, said something a long time ago that just put it into words, but there's growth and discomfort. And, you know, you're creating, you're taking them out of their comfort zone and you want them to experience this growth for the the body, uh, soul, and spirit. And, you know, it doesn't mean you have to degrade somebody or break them down, but dropping them in a situation where, where they're uncomfortable, they, it makes us more, what's the word, malleable, more flexible, more moldable, um, and we get more flexible minds, more flexible bodies, and because uh, we have to, you know, step outside that comfort zone. Uh, I, I think a good day is I try to every day, um, to to find a way to do something that makes me uncomfortable, so I can get just a little bit more comfortable with being uncomfortable, and that that mindset, it's um because I've I've gotten weaker. I've been writing something. Me and um a friend of mine, our, our videographer here at Gum Mag, went out to uh, Rawhide Adventures and we rode adventure bikes. I had never I just I had just bought a bike because I've been wanting my dream bike, an Africa Twin One Thousand, and uh, a week later, a week and a half, we went out to um. California to go ride these big 1250 BMW motorcycles off road. And I, I've up until getting on my bike, I'd never ridden anything over a 650. I'd never ridden anything off road over a 125. And they're putting me on these bikes, and I was the, the, the least experienced, worst rider of the whole group. And we did this pre training, and I was just so far out of my comfort zone. I dropped the bike like three times. Like it, it was just, I, I had, I was in pain. My whole hand was bruised. Like I, I was, I was like, man. I, I am about as far out of my comfort zone as I've been in a long time. And I was like, well, this is the stuff that you like, right? So I, I kept having to, to, to call myself names and everything to, to keep going. But at the same time, I was like, okay, i I got to make this easier, so I need to learn. So I just started doing exactly what they told me to do. And would you believe it that these world-class adventure riders can, like, tell you if you do what they tell you to do that you will be – able to ride and do all these things because like everything was a struggle and we're so wore out and I was doing everything wrong because I had no idea what I was doing no matter what I thought I did going into it what kind of experience or how good I thought I would do none of that matters when you're actually out there doing it you know because yeah. like you you it's the truth it's I got a friend who's really big into BJJ and he's like he's like you can have lies throughout your life he's like but when you're on the mat with somebody like there's it's all truth like there's there's no talking there's no like the tricking it's like it's all truth right there and when you're out there in the wilderness or like what we did with the motorcycle we're putting together a video of that uh, and i've been writing the like the voiceover for it and uh it was a very fun but very powerful experience for me man because i've been getting i've been getting my hair's getting grayer you know it's getting i'm getting i'm getting uh weaker i'm getting 
my, my sometimes I get weaker mentally and weaker physically than I was. You know, I spent a little almost 17 years in the Marine Corps, and I started off in early retirement, and I jumped on it. And I used to be a, a guy who's very mentally and physically tough. Uh, I would say maybe above average right now, but not where I want to be. And that's something that I value in others and value in myself is, is mental and physical toughness. And, you know, what you're doing out there is is something that's – I think it's needed so much today because it promotes self-reliance. And yep. I know I'm talking a lot now and I'll let you talk and I apologize. The, um, I, th- I think – and I, without getting into politics, but I think there's a message here. They're not attacking – you know, we've got we've got strategies and we've got tactics. Attacking masculinity is a tactic. Attacking some of these other things that they're attacking at the lower level and, and uh, the woke culture and all that, those are all tactics to, to change things. The strategy with the, all the systems we have in place, the government organizations, the, the money, the handouts, the other things, else, all these things are designed to, to end one thing, and that's self-reliance. Everything else is just a tactic. That's the ultimate goal is end self-reliance and, and gain more reliance on um, on, on systems and government and that, that gives somebody else power that wants it. And this attack on self-reliance is a incredibly dangerous thing for anything. I think it's incredibly even more dangerous because of who we are as Americans and where we came from and our, our history and, and what we stand for. Um, it violates everything. And you're out there being a voice and, and doing something that, uh, that, that's given people an alternative. And, and promoting self-reliance. I think that's awesome. Well, man, I really appreciate that, Daniel. And, and you're exactly right. And I, and I think if any of your listeners want to really dig deeper into the concepts that Daniel just shared with you, um, study the origins of this great nation that we all live in called uh, America, right? There's a great book out there called, it's actually titled John Adams. John Adams was the second president of the United States of America. And go back and read what these men uh, that were part of the Continental Congress, uh, the the men that signed the de- drafted and signed the Declaration of Independence, the men that put everything on the line for your liberty, uh, go back and read the stories and, and, the, and the quotes from those men, and it's going to help you understand what Daniel's talking about. It's very, very simple uh, to take a little history lesson there. Uh, Most people don't know what happened to them and I, how they never folded, what they all went through. Literally, by signing the Declaration of Independence, they were guilty of treason. The, the repercussion of treason was death by hanging. They put everything on the line. A lot of them lost their families, their homes, yep. their wealth, everything for like your a lot of liberty. Mini jobs. If yeah. you want to make it biblical, it was a lot of mini jobs out there. Yep. That's it, brother. That's it. And you know, prior to that 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 you just shared with us, Daniel, you were talking about having to or, or having to actively maintain that mental toughness, um, that that part of you that, you know, you strive to to be that that person that is mentally tough that that is able to freaking keep just keep coming man and that's what ultra running is for me like you're you know you yes. went out on your moto your your motorcycle uh your off-roading trip well ultra running does that for me that's why I ultra run man it's uh it's an opportunity one if if I'm not out here on the battlefield of life pushing myself then I am disqualified to be here talking to you right now. Yeah. Like, I take this opportunity to, to come on here and speak. I take this very seriously. And, and, and if, if I'm not out here, I'm going to race. I'm going to race in three weeks. I'm going to defend my title at a race that there's no end. There's no end to this race that I'm doing in three weeks. It, I might have to run for 50 hours. I won it last year. Now look, I do these things so you, that wait, I you're gonna race until everybody else drops out. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> that's wild, man. I, I won it last year, man. It, it's a it's a loop, right? It's a loop, and you you just run continuously. Runners, the best runners in the world, come from all over the nation, or, or in the nation, come from all over the nation to do this race. We all assemble, and we run until only one person is left standing. 
Last year, I had to run for a little over 30 hours straight with 35,000 feet of climbing and descent over the course of this race to win this race. So that's like running 30 hours straight, but also climbing and descending Mount Everest all at once. And um, That's incredible, man. That's crazy. Look, man, this is so... Th- this is this is I don't I don't teach or speak from theory. That's what ultra running is, man. It's an opportunity for me to go and and like you said, stay sharp, dude, to grind myself down into this fine powder and learn new things about myself and and, and build new content that I can share with people that maybe they can't go out and do a run like this, man. You know, I'd love to run an ultra. I, I've never, I haven't even, I've never ran a full marathon. I consider myself a half marathon. I've ran a lot of those. Um, got a little race coming up for Memorial Day. It always puts one of my brothers or two of them or three of them on my back and piece of paper and stuff and, and like the carry the load and run, wear blue, run to remember and stuff like that. Uh, we're a gold star family too. My wife lost her little brother in, in Iraq. And so we always go out and do something, you know, for Memorial Day and all that for, for my people and, and hers as well. And, uh, you know, I'd like to go out and run and sweat a little bit, you know, do, not just talk about it, you know, like, go out and do something. And uh, I took a little break this last year from, from running. And um, the other day, it was, it was funny. I, did, I didn't, uh, we weren't scheduled to run with, to go with you or to do this podcast with you yet. And I had my car here and uh, it was raining, so I didn't ride the bike. And uh, I just I had my running shorts on and my pants. So I was like, I just ran home six and a half miles and I hadn't ran in a, in, in a while. I take quite a break and uh, I had to walk about a mile of it, but uh, it felt awesome. And I re- it reminded myself why I ran so much and why I do it. And, uh, and that's just a, such a small level, but it's like, it's like the same thing, but you're at such a, a high level. I never found anything that I don't enjoy running. I don't love to run. Like I, it's not something I, I love to do, but I haven't found anything that calluses the body and strengthens the mind like being in pain for two hours straight three hours straight running it's just it's such a a powerful and emotional thing during and when you're done the battles that you constantly have in your mind and you have to defeat these demons constantly in your mind that want you to stop and everything else like it is it's it's a it's a fight and uh I mean, I'd, I'd, I would love to get to the point to be able to run an ultra marathon. Ever since reading Born to Run, I've been like, these guys are my people. I love them. Uh, the of, I, I had tears in my eyes when he was talking about Scott Jurek uh, sitting at the finish line. Uh, it doesn't matter when he finishes because he was always a winner. He was, like, he was awesome. But he would sit there through the cold the next 24 hours clapping for everybody who crossed the yeah. finish line. And, like, that, that is – I get chills thinking about it. Like, that, that's leadership. That's awesome. That is amazing. And uh, that community just, just sounds – uh, like the right kind of people that I just, I, there's no way I'm going to hang with you, right? but I'll cheer you on. It's awesome. It is, man. It is. And you're right. Running is such a very, it's, it's such a simplistic uh, thing that you can do that really, if you do it for long enough, uh, you're going to reach a point. I even reach a point on these races that are, you know, in excess of a hundred miles at a time. And uh, I reach a point where I don't feel like running anymore. And when you, when you push through that, that's when you grow, right? So I, if I do a 100-mile race, I'm, I literally have to run 90 miles to get 10 miles of growth. So all the growth and all wow. the new stuff I learn about myself comes from that last 10 miles after I push through that point where I'm like, this freaking sucks. I don't want to run anymore. Now, when I push through that, on the other end of that is the growth, man. And, yeah. you know, for me, there are three simple things that, that have kept me alive in the SEAL teams and allow me to freaking crush people in ultra marathons. And it's three simple things that you can all implement. These are the pillars of my life. The first one is patience. You know, that sounds crazy, but it takes a lot of patience to get through the first 90 miles in order to get to the point where you actually get to grow, right? So you got to be patient with yourself. You got to be patient with your teammates You got to be patient with the process. That's the process I'm talking about, that 90 miles to get 10 miles of growth. You got to stay present. I tell people all the time. That's a book title right there. That is a book title, 90 miles to get 10 miles of growth. That's it, man. That's it. It's so true, man. It is. It's profound. 
And then you talk about being present. I told you I won this last man standing race uh, last year. And um, I, it came down to me and one other dude. Everybody else had quit. And it was just me and him going head to head for hour after hour. This other dude's name was Greg. Greg w ran, he runs for the American National Ultra Running Team. He's the one of the best in the world. And I didn't think I could beat this dude, right? Uh, but I was going to keep coming until either my body broke or, or I beat him. That, that, was, that was the only two options that I gave myself. But he came to me at, at a certain point in the race, and he looked at me and he said, Chad, we've got six hours until we reach 100 miles. And I just looked back at Greg, and I smiled at him because I had seen this happen so many times in SEAL training. And I realized in that moment that Greg was no longer focused on the mile that we had to run right then. He wanted it to be over. He was thinking six hours ahead, man. And, and I knew in that moment he couldn't beat me. There, it was impossible for him to beat me at that point. Now, we, we, we kept running for another four or five hours after that. But the interesting thing is when he, when he was no longer present mentally, there was a physical response. And yeah. that's, that's how powerful it is. His body actually started to shut down. And there's a video on my Instagram page of, uh, of Greg coming in on his final loop. And you see his body shutting down. His legs won't work anymore. He just collapses on the ground. And um, it, that was the physical response for, you know, the, the price that he had to pay for no longer being present. And that's a huge pillar. The last one is being deliberate. Um, being deliberate and what i mean by that is if i'm out here on the race course and i've been going for 30 35 hours whatever running and if if i ever stop being deliberate and i twist my ankle or i take a hard fall or something like that my the the, the race is over for me i've lost the battle you have to be deliberate i can't tell you how many teammates that i've lost uh in the seal teams and this is no hit on them, but they had a, a moment where they weren't deliberate, whether it was jumping out of an aircraft, whether it was climbing a caving ladder up the side of a ship, whether it was doing a land warfare maneuver, they weren't deliberate. And, it, and for some of them, it cost them their life. For some of them, it cost them their legs. Um, it, it's so important. And then also being deliberate with every word that comes out of your mouth. You know, the, this is a biblical principle. The Bible says that your tongue is the rudder of your life. It's going to steer your ship, your vessel, in one direction or the other, you can yep. choose by being deliberate about your words. You can choose to go in the right direction or the wrong direction. And um, it's hard to reel that back in when you lose control of your rudder. A lot of times you're, you're out of the fight at that point. It's really hard to reel that back in. So being deliberate, patient, present, deliberate. If you can do those three things in business, in combat, in ultra yeah. running, in whatever you you will likely stay alive and you will likely win you, you you mentioned control and that's something that i the older i get the more you know as a kid growing up like oh if you have some self-control this and that and everything else and you were told this is like one of these 30 character traits that people should have but it kind of fell in there and it wasn't until you know probably a few years ago where i realized like how important it is and how it's kind of the pinnacle because you know when you can't control anything you can control your attitude. You can control yourself. And you can't control anything else out there. And something we talk a lot about on this show, that you get, you get the opportunity to practice self-control when you're driving your car all the time, you know, road rage, whatever. You're, you're constantly getting chances to practice self-control. And I fail all the time, you know, and sometimes I'm, I'm like, oh, I, I had good self-control there. And uh, most of the time I did not. Um, but I, I want to know your take on it because you're a guy who obviously has an incredible amount of self-discipline and self-control to be where you're at in, in many aspects of life and, you know, how you got here. So I, I'm really curious uh, you, you to speak on that. Yeah, self-control is very important. And, uh, you know, your ability to control your emotions, regardless of circumstance, is what's going to set you apart um, in, in any aspect of your life. And you talk about self-control. I mean, I can never, I can never forget... Um, being uh when i was active duty uh we had hit a target uh the the 
the HVI that we were looking to to capture or kill was not on that target. Uh, and we go inside the structure and we realize he's not there. Well, we start taking secondary and tertiary contact from outside the structure. And guys are freaking out, man, because it's a dry hole. We're, think, we're trying to come up with a plan to flex to the next target. You know how hard it's, t- it's tough sometimes to make plans on the fly in that oh, environment. Yeah. And, you know, we're trying to figure, get, you know, receive some intel, think about flexing. What should we do? Should we just, you know, RTB, whatever. And then you throw this secondary contact in the mix from outside the structure. So now we, now it's super crazy. And I'll never forget looking over at our platoon chief and he's sitting in this old rickety chair in the corner of this building uh, and he's on comms and he's just talking in a regular plain calm cool voice right and um and he's been there before yeah i I mean he's talking to air assets man and you know if it wasn't for that man uh that operator in that circumstance that was able to control his emotions uh regardless of the circumstance then there's no telling we we might would have never made it out of out of there successfully Um, that's funny that dude i I say that all the time you know that one person under control confident calm leading even if they're not telling people what to do or physical leadership moving people around just by their sheer presence is a force multiplier can can change everything a hundred percent man uh civilians I think it's hard for them to realize this i mean we've seen it play out in real time and the caveat to this is uh is yes you're right daniel i'll admit just like you man i i fail at that quite often in life and and, and here's the thing uh, i i think that you know this your is standards what, of failing are probably a bit higher than my standards of failing like i <laughs> i'm just guessing here like you you have to do something pretty messed up to fail uh, or you you probably don't have to do much and you're like mad at yourself for failing something uh because you have so you probably have a bit higher standards than most of us humans out there well, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I think that's, that word standards is important also to analyze as it, it goes right along with this conversation. If you are not, if you're always achieving the standards that you've set for yourself, then your standards are not high enough. Yep. So if you're not missing the mark sometimes, you need to reassess your standards, all right? And while we're talking about standards, I live my life by a standard, all right, not a result. Let me explain this to you. I was running a 100-mile race right here in the mountains of North Georgia about three months ago, and I was the, I was the, the crowd favorite to win, right? And I showed up to win. I'm not going to show up to a race unless I'm there to win. And uh, I, I'm running in the I'm first place through about 60 miles, and at 60 miles, my stomach uh, just completely flipped. And when your stomach goes bad in an ultra marathon, uh, it's so painful. I don't care how tough you are. You're not, you can't do anything but lay on the ground in the fetal position. And so I found myself going from first place to fifth place because I had to lay down on the side of the trail in the fetal position until my stomach calmed down. So in that moment, the result that I had set out to achieve was no longer achievable. So why would I run another 40 miles when I can no longer achieve the result that I had set out to achieve? You know why? You know why I got up and ran another 40 freaking miles, right? I did that because my standard says I will never quit. My standard says that I will get up And draw on every remaining ounce of energy to stay in the fight. My standard says I am never out of the fight. My standard says that I will have honor. That means I will adhere to making the right decision. My standard says that I will have integrity. That's doing the right thing when no one is looking. No one was looking at me laying on the ground on the side of that freaking trail, man. Nobody would have known. They would have all said it's justified. They'd have all been like, that's cool. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't give a crap about the result. If I uphold my standard, then I have then I have won. I, I, yep. I, I I've I've done good that day. 
That's where I'm at. Think about that. That's awesome. Think about yeah. that. And you guys listening, have you identified the standards for your life? Let me tell you, the best freaking standard out there, whether you're a Christian or not, is the Bible. It's the number one bestseller in the world. If you want to, that one for a while. Yeah, if you want yeah. a standard to live by, I'm not telling you that you have to believe in Jesus. I think you should. It is common sense to believe in Jesus, if you ask me. That's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> uh, if you want to, if you don't have a standard, look into that book. It's going to give you a high standard to live by, and you should try to achieve that. That's my standard. What other standards do you have, and where do you think they came from before before the you, you know, uh, accepted Christ as your Savior and and uh, get dove into the Bible and everything? Like you, you obviously had some other standards because that happened, um, and we'll get to this in a second. Yeah, I read about your moment when when you called your brother uh, yeah. and everything. Um, and I, I want to talk about that if we can, but, um, what other standards did you have leading before that, before the, the Bible and you, and you found Christ? Well, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, when I, when I was young in the SEAL teams and coming up through training and even through my first deployment and, and, and doing that, you know, to be honest with you, the, the standards that we had were, were basically, uh, the standards that were portrayed by our leaders, right? So we were taught um, whatever whatever standards from the men that we looked up to, the men that we served under, right? And they were the same standards as these biblical standards I'm talking about, standards like mm. integrity, standards okay. like honor, um, you know, things like that. Because here's the thing, the standards that are... Uh, the, the, how about the standard of controlling my rudder, controlling my tongue? Like, I was living by that standard... Uh, I understood how that worked before I read it in the Bible. It's because when something is true, it's because it's, it's right. It's it's right. Just, it's just truth. Yeah. It's just truth. Yep. It, it applies to everyone, right? Yep. Um, so they were similar standards. <clears throat> now, I think when you really uh, when you really uh, uh, strive to uh, live by a biblical standard, uh, it, the the standards definitely increase, right? Because now we have other things like uh, loving your neighbor. That's a lot. <laughs> loving your neighbor is sometimes a lot harder than doing the right thing. Yep. Uh, so the biblical standard is, to me, the, the ultimate standard. But they were essentially the same type things prior to uh, choosing to serve Jesus, if that makes any sense. No, it does. It does. Um, I, I think that's an interesting point. You know, the whenever you got into a highly successful organization, its cultural tenets aligned with uh, the Bible, yeah. basically. Because because anybody who's done anything at a high level uh, finds a level of truth in that. Maybe not in the Bible itself, but the, there are factors common among those things between the two. A hundred percent. So that you did have an interesting story that I, that I read about um, – uh, about whenever you guys were holed up in a house somewhere um, and, you know, out on a mission and things were kind of kind of kind of strange in there. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> I think it just it sounds like it's just super – because I'm into that kind of stuff, but I'm also – you know, and where it went is awesome. So I'm uh, – I, I think it will be great. No, I appreciate the opportunity, man. Yeah, we were, we were on deployment, and it was uh, – me and three other dudes, so four of us total, we were staying in a in a building, and um, uh, this um, th- essentially I can't explain it any other way other than to say there was like this evil presence or this demonic force that was um, permeating this built this place that we were in, and uh, I just remember waking up one night. Uh, and something, something had hit my door, like loud enough to wake me up, and it jolted me awake. And, and then I was laying in my bed, and I could hear this like uh, singing. It, it was some, like, it sounded like some kind of singing or something uh, echoing up and down this hallway. And so I was like, "What the crap?" I knew it was just me and my guys staying in there. So I'm like, "Who the crap is in here?" Like. I need to, I got up out of my bed, 
I open my door. Look, there was nobody there. I walk. My the my teammates were staying in the room right across from the, across the hallway from me. I go into their room. They're freaking passed out. I'm like, man, that's kind of, that's freaking weird, man. And uh, it and the thing is, it was weird in a way that there was fear attached to it. It scared me. Mm. It really did, man. And um, so I, I I didn't say anything about it. And then. As kind of the the weeks progressed, my teammates were having similar experiences to this, like bumps in the night, like weird, uh, a, a very oppressive feeling in this place. It was it was affecting our relationships as teammates. Like you could walk into this place and you felt like uh, there was a stairwell. And it went up, and then it turned back, so it was like a two two flights of stairs. And as you were walking up the first flight of stairs, you could feel it felt like some something was watching you, like it was just like a very uh, bearing down on you, and, and and to the point that like I would turn around and look up and fully expect there to be like some thing, like standing yeah. there, and so my guys w- we would get together in the mornings and we'd be like hey did y'all did y'all hear that last night um uh, or did y'all are y'all feeling this like and and so by the end uh by the end of a, a week or two we were actually all ended up moving and sleeping into the in the same room together it freaked us all out so bad <laughs> and i i just I got to the point where we didn't know how to, we didn't know what to do. We couldn't freaking get any rest. We we were um, not operating well together. And so I called my little brother from my little uh, burner phone that I had. Yes, Navy SEALs can get cell phones overseas. Uh, I know you guys think, oh, that you had a cell phone. Yeah, I had a freaking cell phone. I called my little brother back stateside and I said hey man uh this is what's going on I knew my brother was a Christian and I said can do you know anything about this and he said well let me put you in touch with my pastor and so his uh, we scheduled a call with his pastor and uh, I waited till everybody all my teammates kind of they were not in there and his pastor called me I didn't want to look like a crazy guy because we weren't christian dude we didn't know what was going on here and his pastor i put uh, his pastor i put him on speakerphone and he prays i just hold the phone and just walk around this building and in our room and up and down the hallway and he's just praying uh in the name of jesus for like peace to return and basically get you know casting this evil out of this place from a cell phone (laughs) I know it sounds insane, dude. And he, no, it, all, it all does sound insane, for sure. It's and, cool. and then he's like, all right, man, uh, like take a little bit of, uh, we had a little kitchen in there where we would cook, and he said, take a little bit of oil, just anoint your door. I'm just doing this, man. I'm just going through the process because I'm like, I don't know what else to do. And um, after I do that, like total peace returned to this place, and, and total peace returned to this place, not just – from my experience, but also from my teammates' experiences and perspectives, and and even in amongst our uh, relationships as team members, um, they got better, and and we could sleep, and we could get rest, and we we didn't feel this oppression bearing down on us, and and so I was like, man, there's some power here. Like, this this was a very real experience for me. And if you weren't there and you think this is a bunch of crap, I, I, there's no way I can convince you of the of how real this felt to me. Yeah. And, and yeah. also the guys that were with me. You know, if it was just me, it might would have been different. But, the, you know, when you've got other people kind of sharing that experience with you, um, it really sets sets it in concrete that this there's something going on here that we don't understand. And so that's when I uh, I, I got a Bible— I don't remember if my mom's uh, one of my family members, my mom or somebody may have sent me one, or or I don't remember if one of my buddies had one or something. But I started reading through this um, Bible, and it just freaking made sense to me, man. I was like, "There's some power here. Let me look at this." Starting in the beginning, the story of creation, 
everything in the Bible makes sense to me. The reason Jesus came, died, rose from the dead, it all made sense to me. And so that's when I said, well, this is pretty, this is, this is pretty, this is resonating with me. Let me give my life to Jesus. It's a very simple process. You just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe that he was risen from the dead. And that's really all there is to it. And uh, after that, uh, my life completely changed, man. I mean, I was just, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I did dude, I was a, I was a hell raiser. Like I was a violent person. And, um, when, when I allowed Jesus to come live in me, uh, he just completely changed me in like one night to the point that I got up the next morning. And I remember going down to the, the little, um, platoon hut or ready room. And my buddies were like, what's wrong with you, dude? Like, because they didn't, they didn't, my personality had changed. And so I got it all in one shot, and I've been sold out. Uh, I've been sold out on Jesus ever since then. I never really looked back. Yeah, that's wild. That is wild. It's a great story, though. <sighs> yeah, brother. Yeah, and then that deployment, you know, on throughout that deployment, there were multiple things that, that kind of, you know, that, that, that happened that um, just really helped set my faith in concrete. Uh, I got back home from that deployment. My wife was dying from a drug addiction, and um, oh, no. you know uh, that was that's a whole another part of you know our testimony and and seeing her uh, survive that and get clean and, and you know all of that you know being able to pray for her and then to see her be delivered and 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 healed and you know restored and you know. You just, there's no other explanation for it. And you guys hear about this, you guys keep hearing about this Jesus guy, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I told you earlier, it's common sense to believe in Jesus. Let me ask you this. Back in the day when the Roman Empire and the Jews hung Jesus on a cross, right? They, they, that's a historical fact. That's historical yep. fact. They hung him on a cross Right? They took the body, the dead body, they put it in a tomb. All right? Well, three days later, there was a bunch of daggone redneck fishermen running around town saying, This guy named Jesus rose from the dead. I saw him. He, ro- he, 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 he he's, he's alive. I just saw him. Right? They're spreading this message. Let me ask you this. Why in the crap? Did the, the, the Roman government or the Jews, they were, the, they, were the, the, they were in power at that time. Why did they not just march down to the tomb, drag the body out of the tomb, and drag it through the freaking streets of Jerusalem? All they had to do was produce a body. There would be no Christianity. You got a bunch of redneck fishermen running around saying uh, somebody rose from the dead. All you got to do is produce a body. Why didn't you produce yeah. a body? And then why did these 12, well, at that time, 11 men, why did all of them literally choose to sacrifice their lives for a message, for, for a belief that someone had risen from the dead? These 11 men were the only men on earth that would have known 100% if what they were saying was a lie or if what they were saying was true, right? Yep. These 11 men knew. They knew it was true because they saw this Jesus risen from the dead. I would wager to you that if they would have known that it was a lie, there's not many of them that would have given their lives in horrific ways yep. for that message. It's common freaking sense, man. That's an interesting explanation of it, you know. So, and hard to hard to outdo the uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ with the next topic or anything. We're no worries, about. man. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> but uh, hey, let me ask you this: how how can we track you and follow you? Do you wear a tracker, um, the tracker guys, or whatever the stuff that they do out there, so we can see you on your race? 
So uh, this this last minute standing race that's coming up here in a few weeks, uh, it'll be we'll be covering it down on it on my Instagram. It's just three. Uh, well, my Instagram is Chad Wright two seven eight. Uh, our business Instagram is three of seven project. That's the number three of the number seven project. And um, e- either of those places, I think we got some production guys coming out to film this for a documentary for like Net- Netflix or something. So oh, cool. uh, that that might be. You know that'll be months down the road. When Man, I would love to do that. Out. Get in and film some stuff. Like cause I, I, me and me and my buddy, we like to make some uh, mini documentaries and short documentaries, and maybe a big one one day. And I, I would love to cover some some ultra marathon stuff. That would be awesome. Well, dude, uh, I we mean, just recently did one with a um, we took an old rink, old uh, army veteran, Vietnam veteran, uh, machine gunner out to shoot an m60 he hadn't shot an m60 since 1968 wow and we took him out to the range to shoot an m60 and uh then we interviewed him and, and talked about it and stuff and uh the m60 a little bit but really about before during and and after his his time in vietnam and uh it was awesome man like lots of tears while we're editing and and even filming like it it was really good so we want to do more of those with some with veterans and kind of tell their let them let the individuals tell their stories. There's a lot of folks out there and films and documentaries that cover all of Vietnam or one single battle or anything else, but nobody really lets like you tell your story, or in this case, like Richard, our machine gunner, tell his story. I love that, dude. You know what we're trying to do. I love that. And you guys are more than welcome to hang with me anytime, dude. We got. I'm going to break a world record on a 335-mile-long trail here in North Georgia in October, so that'd be a great film project for us. And, you know, the Vietnam guys, dude – I freaking, I'm so happy that you guys did that, man. That's absolutely amazing. We have a, uh, we have a Vietnam vet, uh, coming on our podcast on Tuesday and he was a member of SOG special observation Mm. group, uh, in Vietnam. And, uh, you want to talk about a war. I mean, and especially the side of the war that those SOG guys had to fight. They had, they had over a hundred percent casualty rate, uh, within their unit and, Dude, there's a, such a part of me that was so that is so. I wish I could have fought with them in that war. It just, I know it was a ter. There was a lot of terrible things that happened, but gosh, dude, they got after it, man. They got oh, yeah. after it, dude. Your fellow frogmen too. I know, <laughs> man. And that jungle environment, dude. That that triple canopy jungle environment. And, and, and no body armor, no nods. Yep. Very, you know, the the old the the, the old carbine. You know, the original M4, yep. twenty round Nothing mags. Nothing works right. Nothing works. Yep. I mean, it would have been. You're a problem solver all day. Yep. <laughs> the, oh, I can imagine. I, I, yeah, the, I, I can't say the same thing that I would have liked to have went back to. Now I've often thought about that about World War Two. Uh, specifically the Pacific and, and I guess the uh, European theater too, but it's um, that that generation. But you know what I, I, I say all the time, and the, the Vietnam generation, what they did, and, and in Korea and World War II, like hats off to them. And, you know, we, we we're, we're down to the last of the World War II genera- uh, fighters. Yeah. We're down to the last of them. So anybody out there that can get a story from them, whether or anything, no matter what it is, cell phone, video, anything, let's 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 keep capture that. That's what me and Charlie wanted to do. I love and, that. You know, man. We're we're running out of the World War II guys, low on the Korean guys, the Vietnam guys are are in the kind of the beginning of the end. You know, it's like, and not that they're all going to die soon, but like they're they're dropping. You know, and and I the, once these stories are gone, they're they're, you know, I look at some friends of mine that that I lost, you know, in combat, and uh, it it would hurt me to know that their story was never told. And every time one of these, you know, Vietnam vets passes away, their story's dying, but there's also 17, 20, a hundred other stories dying with them. Yep. And if we can get those out of them, cause they're, they're admirable. They're heroic. They're, they're amazing. And, uh, you know, they, they, but we're losing them. And that's, we, we wanted to, to collect some of those things. And you know, like you, you have your story, uh, and what you're doing, and you're out here telling your story and, and other people's stories, and, and I, I, it's awesome. But the uh, if we can get the the, um, the Vietnam folks out there and tell those stories, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm going to Vietnam. Just doesn't 
didn't sound like a, an amazing good time to me. Well, you but, uh, you know what it is, Daniel, and, and and I still I've only been out of the Navy for about two years, and, and I and I need to do some work on this part of myself. But you know, there's a part of me, quite often, that is still just hungry for a fight, man. When when you when you become when when you literally become a warrior you you dedicate your entire life to training and becoming a a warrior uh and you walk that path your mind gets warped like not not in a not in a bad or dangerous way no, but you're, you're i i you're a hundred percent on target right now you you get so hungry for for a fight something to strive against and no matter how far i run out here in an ultra marathon it's it's not it's not gonna even come close to the fights that you've got to partake in uh you know as a seal or in the marine corps uh it just nothing can match it man yep. and no it's not close you know it, I've, I've been looking for it for a long time and it's got me in trouble i spent money on things that i shouldn't have been spending money on things i it's been there's the positive piece of it there's a negative piece of it you know and it's like um it's i almost i went through the whole pipeline about a year and a half ago to be uh, a deputy sheriff because i'd done a lot of training with their swat team and stuff and uh teaching their swat team having them on the range and um love these guys and and i was like and they were talking to the sheriff like let's get them over on the team quick we don't need to wait the whole year and this and that and uh, they're pretty active. They get called out a lot, and and I it was, it was yeah. I want to help my community. And that's why I volunteer doing some stuff and do some other things, and I, I care about other people. But it was, I I miss having some level of threat on my life and having other men depending on me to be in good shape mentally and physically, and and me depending on them and going against something evil together. Yeah, like that, and and the risk of death for like I. It, it's not a thing that you can replace with anything else out there. It's hard. So even now, uh, I'm, I want to free up some time in the future and, and become a reserve officer to help serve my community, but also, you know, scratch an itch that's, that, that I've been missing. And I, it hurts. You know, like, uh, you can probably I, – maybe I don't have the discipline anymore, but unless I have a long-term goal or other people relying on me, you know, like I, my family is what does it for me right now. Like they need me to stay alive and be here. That's why I train to fight. That's why I train uh, and exercise and everything else is because uh, I need to stay here and, and take care of them. If I didn't have that without having a team, you know, like you're used to having a team and, you know, I am as well in, in the military. Um, it's That's what usually got me not eating that donut, you know, going for that run, you know, putting that pack on and doing something extra, a little bit extra thing in the pack, you know, like those things – uh, it's not just doing the bare minimum. It's like these guys are going to depend on me to be my best. And I was in a position once where uh, we were breaking contact, and I just started walking because I had no more energy. And I said to myself, that's never going to happen again because I was just done. There was just nothing. Like I, ha I spent it all, everything. you know. And I, I'm not ashamed that I spent it all because I needed to. It was just like I didn't have any more. And I was like, I need to get a little bit more in that well some way is, uh, is what I learned there. I love that, brother. I love that, man. And it's uh yeah, it's it's a very unique thing, man, that that I still don't have it all figured out and you know, I I, I have this, you know, I have this uh I don't know if you call it a burden or what, but I can't tell you how many times that I walk into the gym and civilians don't understand this mindset. I I'll, I'll walk into the gym and you know, somebody, some dude in the gym will be like are you ready for this, man? You know, are you, you ready to get after it? And I'm like, I just look at them like they're idiots. I'm like, I don't have the luxury to not be ready. Right. Cause I, I'm not a freaking athlete. I'm not, yep. I'm not here to be an athlete. I'm here because I want to train like I fight. I want to be ready and prepared for a fight. You know why? Because the world and the people around me look at me differently. They look yep. at me differently. When crap hits the fan, if it ever does, guess what? Guess who people are going to look at to step up? Guys like me and you, and if Daniel. If you don't step up, what is that going to do to yourself mentally? 
That's my biggest if fear. If you're not ready, if you're yeah, if you're not yep. ready, man. And so this is a this is a whole nother freaking mindset that people just don't get it, man. I'm not in here to be an athlete. I'm not doing ultra marathons because I because I want to be a, a ultra marathon runner. I'm doing this to train like I fight to stay ready because it is the burden that I have accepted. And I'm not taking a freaking day off. And I'm not showing up at the gym to just get through the workout. I'm showing up at the gym to freaking beat everybody there. I don't know. Maybe I'm a weirdo. I don't know. No, you're definitely a weirdo. There's no doubt about that. You know, I think that you say it about every ultra marathoner. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're wrong. I just, uh, you know, maybe, maybe if, uh, if other veterans that are listening to this uh, understand what you have is special and own it, man. Don't be ashamed of it. Freaking own it. Yeah, people look at you differently. That's a good yep. thing. Now step up and own it. You know, I I keep I'm about, I keep almost ending this because I've taken up so much of your time, and I, I apologize, Chad. This has been a great talk. No, I, man, I, really I appreciate it. it, brother. But we're walking up to something that that's very that I'm very passionate about, and that I, I have kind of my own theories about it, and I, I want to hear yours. Um, I believe that I am enhanced by my post traumatic stress syndrome disorder, whatever we're calling it these days. I believe that that what I've seen of people dying young and how understanding how vulnerable I am and almost dying a couple times. Um, life is short, it's fragile. Us humans are squishy. We can die really easily. We're not special. We're just a whisper in the wind on this pale blue dot, you know, if we quote Carl Sagan. Nothing special at all. Um, it just baffles my mind that the people have had such egos to take over continents and worlds and kill people and stuff because they're they're insignificant, just like I am. And uh but what this does for me, this post traumatic stress, it's that that sense of uh not I don't think I'm gonna live a long time. It's like how? Why would there's men that I saw men that were better than me didn't make it? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that say about me? I, I I can't possibly make it very long, right? Like, so there's no way. So it's it surprised I got this long. Um, that creates a sense of urgency of me to make a bigger impact, bigger impact on my family, my my children, um, people around me, and uh, you know the veterans, other veterans in the community that can make an impact as well, uh, or non-veterans. There's like tons of good people that aren't vets. Um, but that sense of urgency, I think, is a powerful thing. And uh, I may procrastinate sometimes, but when it's time to do something, like I, I usually go after it full sin. Sometimes it's it's a negative thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. Um, but I believe that we're enhanced in that way. If if I can find that, if I can spin it to a positive, because I'm, I'm a big believer in in positive thinking and uh, a big fan of uh, Viktor Frankl and some of the things that he said. And um, very very smart guy. Had a lot of things figured out. Uh, pretty well that still hold true and the um i i think that if we if we look for the positives in it we can find a lot of them how we still have that we're still switched off safe sometimes you know we're still um yeah, hyper vigilant which i think uh unless it's a point where it's, it's creating negative things in your life then it could be negative but hyper vigilance itself i don't believe it to be a negative at all i think it's a it's a great thing for uh a capable man to have and woman um, so I, I, I choose to, I make the choice and I, I do believe it's a cognitive choice. I, I make the choice to, to focus on the positive attributes from my experience and the disorder or whatever we're calling it, uh, rather than the negatives. <laughs> Brother, I, you, I don't know how I could put it any more eloquently than that. Other than to say, I completely agree with you and, and you're exactly right, man. Uh, this thing that's labeled post-traumatic stress. Now, I, I'm speaking from my, this is my own case because I, I've been diagnosed with PTSD too. Sure, and we, uh, we all had a different experiences that, in combat. That's right. I, I get it. So, so you, speaking for myself as well. You guys that are listening, I, I don't know what your situation is, but for my situation, uh, I view those PTSD symptoms as simply a result of the lifestyle that I have chosen and, 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 and they are necessary traits of a warrior. They're necessary traits for a, yeah. a, a, a operator to have in a battlefield environment. 
they're not bad. Um, for me, you're exactly right, Daniel. They enhance me. Let me tell you what I've done to kind of rein that in, though. Um, because, because even for me, sometimes because of these traits we're talking about, I can go a little too hard. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and we call it a, dis- a disorder because everyone around you, all those people I was telling you about at the gym, I, sometimes your wife can't keep up that's right yeah and your people around you mm-hmm. yeah no I, I know what you mean and all, and you walk into the the crossfit gym and all these cats around you are looking at you like holy crap man this dude's freaking crazy and, and like it, it weirds people out but um i have surrounded myself with a few other men one being my brother uh uh and and a few other men in my inner circle and i have given them uh authority to rein me back in all right so this Hmm. has helped me tremendously i've surrounded myself with strong men strong men of character that share the same standards that i share even though none of them have served in the military one of them's 19 years old all right but i i've set them down and i've said look we have a podcast i've got on that podcast before when i'm fired up about something and I've just went way too hard. I've I've went so hard that probably people would just stop listening to the podcast because they don't understand what I'm trying to. Well, they don't understand where I'm coming from. So these men, yeah. I've set them down. Say you have full authority to rein me in and tell me when I when I am going too hard, when I'm getting a little sideways, and they'll come to me and say, "Hey, Chad, man, I just listened to that episode, dude. I I, I kind of know what you meant, but let me tell you what everybody probably heard." Uh, and, and, and I've, I've went in and deleted an episode and re-recorded it and came back and said, all right, let's approach this from a more, uh, meaningful angle. Not that I'm compromising on the message, but they just rein me in. It's helped me tremendously, man, giving them that authority over me yeah, and, and trusting none them. None of us should be allowed to drink our own Kool-Aid constantly either. A hundred percent. You that in your life. That's it, brother. Yep. Especially when you're, especially when you're going so, you're just, you're just, going so hard man you know yep so that's helped me a lot be be very cognizant of of that inner circle that you have around you and it doesn't need to be many people i'm talking like two or three of the right people and uh and it's going to help you it's helped me tremendously as long as you keep thinking like an individual all right as long as you keep going through life with that individualistic mindset you're going to continue to fail and life's going to continue to drag your freaking butt through the mud. I promise you. Yep. Chad, where can people like follow you and, and get more from you, your podcast, your Instagram, your uh, the 3-7 project? Are they going to look into that? Uh, can you hit me with that? I those? appreciate that, brother. Yeah, the best place is, is our website. Uh, it's 3of7project.com. That's just the number three of the number seven project.com. Everything's linked up on the website, the podcast, uh, Instagram, we're on YouTube. Uh, so, you know, a little bit more about the basic course, the proving grounds and all that stuff is, is there if you want, if you want to see it. Um, you know, business is a weird thing. You know, on Instagram, I've had an Instagram for about two years now. I didn't even know what Instagram was. I got on there and somehow I got like 60 something thousand followers on there. And I've realized though, like mm-hmm. I want people to follow I want people to to learn about 3 of 7 project the brand Chad is weak and fallible all right don't look like look at Chad's a part of 3 of 7 project along with these other men that I've just kind of briefly told you about that's so much bigger than me man so check out the website 3of7project.com all right that's awesome Chad you do not meet the stereotype of Chad's out there these days right you're you're supposed to be drinking like uh, a white monster and being angry, like you know, uh, stereotype. That's pop awesome. Collars. That's awesome, yeah. brother. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be following you. I actually followed you uh, right before this, right here, and I, I want to see uh, what you have going on in in that race. Man, I you're gonna crush it. I'm not even gonna say good luck. I, I you got the mindset in the right spot, and obviously mentally and physically where you need to be. I want to talk to you again about some mindset stuff. Like, just get on here and just talk about mindset. Yeah, at some point in the future, something Varg, my my co-host, we we talk a lot about. Um, 
you know, the mindset. And I think that's a thing that's that's used a lot in the tactical and firearms world, but it's not understood nearly as much as it's used and what that really means. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure you got it down. So uh, you'd be a great person to talk to. About Anytime, that. brother. Let's jump on. Let's uh, we'll jump back on uh, maybe post post mid state mile, and and I'll give you guys a little. That, that race is called the mid state mile. Uh, we might can jump on post that. Maybe there'll be some new things that we can talk about, new things I learn about myself. Uh, hopefully there'll be a competitor that shows up there that will uh, give me a run for my money. It can't be epic without without the right competitor. <laughs> That's the right attitude right there, see? That's the right mindset. Like, I hope this. I, hope I got somebody. That, that. Or do you want that because you need them to push you, or do you want that because you want a challenge? Both? Uh, I, I, I want it for both because since this is a last-man-standing race, if there's not someone there that's fairly equally matched to me, it won't be epic because everyone else will quit before I'm actually, uh, okay. you know, before I'm that tired. So, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, right now I'm stronger than I've ever been in my life. I don't feel like anybody in the world can beat me, but that's just the way that I feel. Uh, surely there'll be somebody. Sh- people are hungry to beat me because I talk a lot of crap, by the way, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, so people are hungry to beat me, and I'm hoping somebody will show up, show up there and prove me wrong. The best possible outcome is for somebody to beat me. That's the best possible yeah. outcome because yeah. that yeah. means... Did you think it happened twice? Yeah, that means if somebody beats me there, that means that they gave me the opportunity to find my absolute limit. And that's what I'm looking for. Guys, that was Chad Wright, Navy SEAL, ultra marathon runner, all around awesome guy out there helping uh, people become better humans. And uh, while he's on his path of becoming a better human himself, uh, thanks for listening. And until next time, the Mag Life out.